Good morning. So it's really humbling to be here in front of all of you. Um, the first thing that I wanted to say is that I'm, I'm grateful to be here, and I'm grateful to be talking to you. Um, what I want to do in the next hour is I'm going to go over how to protect your health after a transplant uh, using donor cells after allogeneic transplantation. But the, the talk is going to go only for 35 or 40 minutes, and from there, all that I want to hear is questions. I'm here to answer questions. So and I'll do my best to share what I've learned over the years and what I've learned from you. And that's what I'm here for. So the name of my talk, Stripe Stripe, how to protect your health after a transplant using donor cells. So these are my objectives. Uh, I will define what is a survivor, what, what is survivorship after transplant. I'm going to describe the most common long-term complications that we see in transplant recipients. I'm going to go over the risk factors for them, how do we screen for these complications, uh, how do we treat them, and what you can do to prevent them and, and help be on top of, of these problems to control them and treat them. When I was preparing my talk, I bumped into this history. This is Nancy King McLean history. She's the world's long longest living bone marrow transplant survivor. This is a woman that was transplanted from an identical twin for acute leukemia when she was 11 years old. That was in 1963. She's still alive, and she has had a, a productive, normal life, which is what we all want from you. So who is a BMT survivor? So this is just a general definition that I found in the National Cancer Institute Dictionary. One who remains alive and continues to function during and after overcoming a serious hardship or life-threatening disease, like you all did. In cancer, a person is considered to be a survivor from the time of diagnosis until the end of life. For us, it's from the time of having a bone marrow transplant until the end of life. That's the time of being a survivor. So a survivor is a person that after going through disease and then going through a transplant, adjusts to a new normal. There are many, many physical and emotional changes that will happen due to the treatment, due to the disease, due to the transplant itself. And the person will be a new one, like was uh, described in the previous talk, so there will be many changes and there will be a new normal that, we, that the patient will have to adapt and grow from there. So the definition of survival includes anyone else that was surrounding the patient and was impacted by the transplant experience. So it will include the caregivers, the family members, even the close friends, or any person that was in close relationship with the patient during this experience. So what is the good of allogeneic transplant? The good of allogeneic transplant that as the time goes by, we are learning and we're getting better at it. So if you go back 20, 20 years ago, the long-term survival was only 42%. But the years have gone by, you have seen that the one-year survival from 2010 to 2012 is 63.6, so about two-thirds of the patients become long-term survivors. And I think we're getting even better and better as the time goes by. What is the bad? Well, two-thirds of the bone marrow transplant survivors will report at least one chronic health condition compared with 39% of their of their healthy siblings. So 79% of survivors will have a non-malignant late effect or complication five years after transplantation. Um, and the life expectancy is still lower for transplant survivors than 
compared with the general population due to some of these medical problems. Now you see here, over time, from the transplant moment, in the first two years in particular, the risk of relapse from the primary disease goes down and eventually disappears completely. But then the patient will develop some medical problems that were a consequence of the treatment itself, the transplant, or the disease itself. But you are not alone. So the number of transplant survivors continues only growing. So if there were about a little over 100,000 BMT survivors in the United States in 2009. But now it is expected that by the year 2030, there will be half a million bone marrow transplant survivors in the United States. So what are the risk factors for all the problems and complications that we see after transplant? So they all start from pre-transplant medical issues. Many patients at the time they develop leukemia or lymphoma, they already had you know, coronary artery disease, diabetes, high blood pressures. So they came with some medical problems already. And then they go through the treatment of the primary malignancy. They are diagnosed, they get chemotherapy, radiation, hormone therapy, all the treatments that we do. And then eventually they go to transplant. And then they will have additional intervention, high dose chemotherapy, immunosuppressives, antibiotics. Some of them will develop acute or chronic graft to host disease. And then they will need medications and treatments for that. And they will have some consequences. And in addition, some of them will have infectious problems or uh, organ injury or other issues will arise. Now, in all of this, each patient is different. There is that generic predisposition to certain problems that some patients will have, some others will not develop those problems. There are some problems will depend on age. Older patients that go to transplant tend to have more problems and complications post-transplant. Also depends on sex. Some complications will affect more women than men. And depends on the previous lifestyle of the patient. Now, this one looks very complicated, but what I just wanted to convey the message is that the complication that we see after transplant affect every, almost every organ or every system in the body. So you see here, patients may develop psychological problems, pulmonary diseases, heart, cardiovascular diseases, stroke, coronary artery disease, kidney injury, iron overload, and I'm going to go over many of these in more detail. So, but the message is that many organs are affected by the treatments that we use, by the disease, and we see the effects post-transplant. So let's start from the heart. So um, the two major problems that we see after transplant are coronary artery disease and cardiomyopathy. And cardiomyopathy, I define it here as heart muscle disease, which is essentially weakening of the heart. So coronary artery disease is more common in transplant survivors and starts at an earlier age. Um, stroke is also more common. And some of the deaths that we see in bone marrow transplant survivors, up to 10%, come from cardiovascular problems. And that's why this is important. So the incidence in general is three times higher than in the general population. Um, cardiomyopathy, the main risk factor is some of the chemotherapy agents that, that we use. For example, maybe some of you, you remember having received something called uh, uh, doxorubicin or adremycin. This is a medication that could cause some heart damage and weaken your heart. So risk factor for heart problems, um, some of them are independent of the transplant itself, like having a high blood pressure, being diabetic, high cholesterol. These are 
this happened whether you had a cancer or not, or whether you had, were treated for, or you had a transplant or not. But some others will come from the transplant process itself, like uh, if you got total body radiation as part of your transplant, or if you got chest radiation during the treatment of your malignancy. Sometimes we do that in lymphoma. Chemotherapy agents, I already mentioned, anthracyclines as a cause of heart injury and weakening of the heart. And there is always some genetic susceptibility. Some of these problems will affect some patients while others are not affected at all. What can you do to improve your, your heart health? So these are the most important things. First of all, lifestyle modification. I'm gonna say this many times during my talk. Stop smoking. And if you have even considered it, don't do it. It's gonna hurt you, so it's just, I will keep saying that. So, low fat diet, maintaining a healthy weight, regular exercise, this is critical. Maintain a good cardiopulmonary function will represent many more years of life. Um, diabetes testing, so that will primary doctor, your primary doctor will do that. Fasting lipid testing that should start probably a little bit earlier than general patients. And sometimes the doctor will want, in, will want to do imaging of your heart, like echocardiogram, electrocardiogram, if the doctor is suspecting that the, doc, the heart is already weak or has problems. Now let's talk about, let's change here, let's talk about your lungs. So in, when we talk about the lungs, we essentially have two types of problems. We have non-infectious non complications, and we have infections. That's, those are the main problems within the lung. So the most important one that I want to mention is bronchiolitis obliterans. This is a word that literally means um, narrowing of the bronchi, narrowing of the branches of your bronchi. This is a classical manifestation of chronic rubber zoonosis disease. About one on every six patients with chronic rubber zoonosis disease will develop this serious problem. And how do we know that is happening? Well, a patient will say that he's feeling short of breath, that it's getting harder to go up stairs or walk for 15 minutes. And then we will screen patients with pulmonary function tests. Many of you have had pulmonary function tests at different time points after transplant. And that's the way we monitor this. And in cases that we suspect is already happening, we're gonna do a CAT scan of the chest and look at images of your lungs. So we treat this with oral or inhaled steroids and a Powerful anti-inflammatories like Montelukas, but well, that's just the name of the medication. The other problem that we frequently see in, 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 as a lung complication is infection, pneumonia. So pneumonia is fairly common after bone marrow transplantation. So, and the main risk factor is a compromised immune system. Every patient that goes after a bone marrow transplant will have an, a compromised immune system for a variable time, six to 12 months at least. And then you will be at risk of acquiring lung infection from virus, from bacteria, and very rarely from, even from fungi. So the main prevention is interaction with your doctor. The, your doctor will give you medications to decrease the risk of infection, like prophylactic antibiotics, Many of, many of you probably took an antiviral, an antimicrobial, and an antifungal for several months after transplant. Vaccination, I'm gonna go over that in more detail down the road, but vaccination is always important to prevent infection. And, well, I'm not gonna go over the treatment. I wanted to mention this one, antibody replacement. We all have antibodies in the blood there are proteins that we all carry to fight infection. After transplant, some of the antibodies go low, but we can replace them. And in that way, we can diminish the number of pulmonary infections that a patient will develop. 
what can you do to protect your lungs? So first of all, be, be vigilant and report any change in your exercise tolerance. You know, you are doing well and you start noticing that you are getting short of breath easily or you have a persistent cough. This is the time to talk to your doctor. Um, pulmonary function tests, as I already said, we will do this at a certain time points to monitor your pulmonary function. Vaccination, and as I said before, don't smoke. And avoid toxic exposure for, for, to fumes or to any environmental exposure. Now let's talk a little bit about your liver. Probably the most important problem that we have in the liver is iron overload. So, and here to understand iron overload, all of you during the transplant got transfusions, got red cell transfusions. Each time you get a red cell transfusion, those red cells carry a little bit of iron. It's hard for the body to get rid of that excess iron, so it sits on your organs, particularly in your liver. The more transfusions you get, the more iron you will deposit in your liver. And it comes to a point that it will cause progressive inflammation and damage on your liver. So, and that's the reason why we, we are very careful about this. So about 25 to 50 percent of fellow survivors have elevated liver iron concentration. In particular, those of you who had a transplant for acute leukemia, because even before the transplant, you already had many, many red cell transfusions. So how do we monitor this? We are going to follow the ferritin. This is a, a, a blood test. Each time your doctor sees you in clinic, he's going to not every time, but periodically, he will check your ferritin level. And in that way, we will know how high are your iron deposits. And we can intervene to, go, to make them go down. So how do we treat it? We remove iron. And there are essentially two ways to do it. Iron chelation, these are medications that we give. It, they, it used to be only IV or subcutaneous. But now they come as pills, so it's easier to do, it's easier to take. And these pills, they will grab the iron in your liver and it will go through your urine and in that way, slowly but surely, it will go down. And in patients that are fully recovered with normal hemoglobin, we can do phlebotomies. Phlebotomies is take one unit of blood from the patient once a month. And that is actually the most efficient and most physiologic way of doing it, the, the one that works best. Other potential liver problems, not infrequently we have to deal with hepatitis viruses. So some patients, a small number of patients, carry hepatitis B or hepatitis C, at the time we see them for transplant, they already have the viruses. Or sometimes they get a transplant from a bone marrow donor who carries the virus and then they will acquire the virus. So we need to know those things in advance and then we will have to use antiviral throughout the transplant to protect the patient because when your immune system is weak is when these viruses wake up and grow and cause trouble. Chronic rubber to heart disease affects the liver, but I'm not gonna go over chronic rubber to heart disease because there, are, there is one or two sessions specifically on that. I'll be happy to answer questions, but I'm not gonna go in detail on that. Cirrhosis is the extreme of liver damage. Sometimes we see it, fortunately it's rare, but it's the most advanced liver damage from hepatitis or from toxicity or from iron overload. What about your kidneys? So it's very common in transplant to see patients, well not very common, but probably one fifth of the patients will develop a kidney injury, kidney damage and they will lose some degree of kidney function. So 
Typically, patients will not feel anything. How are we going to know? Well, each time you go see your doctor, we're going to measure your creatinine, your BUN, and we're going to see, oh, it's going up. Okay, what is happening here? So, and some of the medication that we use, the immunosuppressives, pretty much all of you receive tacrolimus or uh, cyclosporin to protect you from Graves' or disease. These medications put a lot of pressure in your kidneys. And in some patients, nothing happens, it's okay. But in, there is a proportion of patients that will develop some degree of kidney damage from these medications. Chemotherapy agents, there are a few chemotherapy agents like platinum, sometimes causes kidney damage. And this one is one that you can control, blood pressure. You guys have to be vigilant and monitor your blood pressure and make sure it's always in the right level. So what can you do? As I said, blood pressure control and report symptoms. Although they are usually late, when you already develop significant kidney damage, you could develop swelling. Your legs get very swollen, retain fluid, get very weak. And then you, you really need to let your doctor know. I know this is also rare, but you could also see some changes in the aspect of the urine. Thyroid problems are fairly common after transplant. In particular, hypothyroidism, three to five percent of all the transplant recipients. Older patients tend to become hypothyroid. Radiation to the thyroid or to the neck will typically lead, lead to hypothyroidism, which is lack of production of thyroid hormones. It's more common in women. Even without transplant, it's more common in women to see hypothyroidism. Uh, symptoms are rare until it's very advanced. And we would always monitor thyroid hormones throughout the transplant and after transplant. Fortunately, this is relatively simple to fix. We just need to give hormone replacement in the form of pills, and that will suffice to treat this problem. Diabetes. This is probably more important. 8 to 40 percent of the patients after transplant will develop or will become diabetic. Why is that? Because some of the medication that we use will put a lot of pressure in your pancreas, like the immunosuppressives. They, they make you develop intolerance to glucose. Or like esteroids. Many of, the, of you receive esteroids for Graves or Hodges disease treatment. <clears throat> and then esteroids will make your blood sugars go up. And if you are on esteroids for a long time, you may become diabetic. So how do we prevent this? Diet modification and exercise. You will hear this many, many times during this talk weight loss and glucose monitoring. And once it happens, well, you will have to see your doctor and get, get treatment with oral medications or insulin. Sexual health in men. So it's very common to develop hypogonadism, which is essentially low production of sex hormones in men after transplant. Happens in approximately half of the bone marrow transplant survivors so these are the most common symptoms, erectile dysfunction, low sexual drive, and we will know because we will find a low testosterone level in the blood, and patients will also have general symptoms like fatigue. So we would monitor this in all patients, and we could always do testosterone replacement in selected cases uh, to help fix this problem. In women, it's also common to have low sex hormone levels after transplant. Many women will develop ovarian failure and early menopause after transplant. In young women, it's common. So symptoms are early menopause, vaginal changes, low sexual desire, fatigue, and I forgot, forgot to put here, um, Decreased bone density, your bones will become weak and your cardiovascular risk will also increase when you develop an early menopause. There is no specific prevention, but we can always use hormone replacement in a very individualized 
for way because we cannot do hormone replacement on everybody. So, for example, if there is a history of breast cancer in the family, we're not going to be able to do it. Fertility. So, most of the male transplant recipients will become infertile. They will develop azospermia. That's the, the name, but essentially it's a no or low sperm, sperm count. 70% of bone marrow transplant survivors. Happens, it depends on age. Very young patients have a good chance of recovering from this if they are in their 20s. But older patients will, will develop uh, this low sperm count. Also depends on chemotherapy intensity. If you got one of the mild or later regimens, is very the, the chance that this is going to happen is a lot higher. So we would always recommend in young patients or in patients that want preserve want to preserve fertility to do sperm banking or more complex techniques like testicular sperm retrieval. Same in females, in women. There is also a high, very high incidence of, of ovarian failure, early menopause, and infertility. So, it, again, it depends on age and chemotherapy intensity. However, we see pregnancies after transplant. We see women that recover menstrual cycles and become pregnant after transplant. So, but we always say wait a couple of years. We don't want you to get pregnant in the first two or three years. Why? Because that's the time when you are still at risk for relapse from the malignancy and for graft versus host disease. So we want you to pass that time. And then if you want to pursue a pregnancy, go for it. <laughs> okay. So we always recommend fertility evaluation before transplantation for cryopreservation of all sites. Bone health, so osteopenia or osteoporosis. So many of you had these bone density tests where we look at how hard your bones are. So if, if they are weaker, we will call it osteopenia. But if they are very weak, the most severe osteopenia, we're going to call it osteoporosis, which essentially means your bones, are, your bones become brittle and they are at high risk for fractures. So this is very important. And so it depends on the treatments that you got. In women, the early menopause will be associated with this. And this is one of the strongest risk factors, this extended prolonged use of steroids like prednisone will make your bones very weak. Prevention with good calcium and vitamin D intake, this is something that all of you can do and should do. Weight-bearing exercise, mobility exercise is critical to preserve your bone health. And what well, we will always uh, periodic, periodically, we are going to measure your bone density. And there are several treatments to make the, the bones strong again, like some of that I mentioned here, by phosphonase, calcitonin, hormone replacement in women. A vascular necrosis, this is more in younger patients. A few of you probably develop this complication. A vascular necrosis is when a segment of your bone doesn't have blood flow and dies. So the, it becomes necrotic because of lack of blood flow. Typically affects the hips more than the knees and occasionally the ankles and shoulders. The main risk factor is steroid use. Patients who have been high doses of steroids for extended periods of time. And this is up to your doctor to diminish as much as possible your exposure to drugs like prednisone. Now, the treatment sometimes is conservative, physical therapy, uh, retraining, but many patients eventually will need a hip replacement or a knee replacement for these type of problems. Myopathy, so this is weak muscles. So the main risk factor for myopathy are Esteroids again, esteroids will make your muscles very weak. 
and lack of physical activity. When you are in a transplant unit, you don't move much, you don't walk much. By the time you are out of the hospital, you already have significant muscle atrophy. And then if you don't move, if you don't exercise, it will get worse. So here is critical to limit the use of steroids and to exercise. Okay. Infection, all bone marrow transplant survivors have some degree of immune deficiency that is the highest in the first three months. Your immune system is weak. Slowly but surely it recovers and eventually becomes normal and you can have a normal life. But still during those months or even a few years, you are at high risk for opportunistic infections, viral infections, bacterial infections. So this, the immunosuppressive medications that you take will weaken your immune system. And if you develop chronic rubber disease, you are going to be at risk for infection. So we will always give antimicrobials while in immunosuppression to decrease the risk of infection. And we would always monitor your immune function, measuring your, your immune cells in the blood, and we will know how you are doing. Vaccination. I wanted this, this is very, very important. So if you remember, once you go to transplant, get high dose chemotherapy, you will lose all the immunity that you had to all those vaccines that you got in childhood. You have to be revaccinated, otherwise you're gonna be at risk for all of this. And not only that, you can transmit it to other people. So there is, this is a double problem here. It's personal and it's also social because you could become a transmitter of the disease. So we would always revaccinate you to for polio, diphtheria, tetanus. I miss putting here pertussis. Hepatitis B, hemophilus influenza, pneumococcal pneumonia. This is MMR. Nowadays, you have heard about the measles outbreaks going all over the country due to lack of vaccination. Varicella zoster. And always remember to get, get your yearly flu vaccine. Second malignancies. The incidence of a second cancer is higher in transplant recipients and it's about one to 6% at 10 years after bone marrow transplant. And these are the most common ones that we will see. Mouth cancer, skin cancer, breast cancer, and thyroid cancer. And they depend on, on, on exposure to certain risk factors. For example, if you got radiation to the chest, like we do in patients with Hodgkin's disease, you're gonna be at a higher risk for breast cancer. If you develop chronic rubber so this is affecting your mouth and mouth dryness for a long time, you're gonna be at risk for mouth cancer. You are also a, have a higher risk of a skin cancer in general after bone marrow transplantation. So you have to be vigilant of those things. The, the risk of leukemia and MDS is only in recipients of autologous transplant, not in donor transplants. So we would always recommend you to be up to date with your cancer screening. I'm not gonna go over all that table, but I just want to convey the message that you should be up to date on your screening for breast cancer. Get your mammogram sometime through your primary care doctor. Get your pap smear and human papillomavirus virus DNA test. Screening for colorectal, you can do fecal occult blood, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy. Your primary care physician will take care of that. So you should also have a routine skin exam once a year. Go to your dermatologist, have him check your skin. Lung screening for lung cancer is mostly for smokers. For heavy smokers, they have to have these high resolution CAT scans of the chest periodically. Oral, see your dentist. Your dentist will be the first one to notice an unusual lesion in your mouth. Or sometimes you will feel it. Oh, I'm feeling something new here. What is this? Thyroid, this is in the annual physical exam. Now, a few more things. Uh, neurocognitive and psychosocial. 
There is also a session on this, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But essentially, you all have heard about chemo brain. So what is chemo brain? So essentially, it's, it's slow brain function. So the patient will have problems with short-term memory, slow thinking, learning problems, learning impairment, decreased executive function, so some difficulties to function in daily life. So it happens to some degree to most transplant survivors, but it recovers in almost all of them for the most part. It's caused by all the treatments or by the, the transplant experience itself. So it declines in, the, declines in the first three months and improves it expected to improve within the next one to five years in most patients. We also see other things. We see depression. We see post-traumatic stress disorders. When transplant was a really traumatic experience, you will be at risk for PTSD. And we'll also see a lot of anxiety on many of our patients. So how to thrive after your transplant? So here it's important to understand that there will be a time of recovery, slowly but surely recovering from the first few days after transplant until you can actually say, oh, I am back to a normal life or to my new normal life. So it will take three months, six months, a year in which you will progressively get closer to a functioning, productive life. Active grabber to host disease will delay recovery, and that's why it is important to prevent it and treat it, treat it on time. And always recognize that you will have a new baseline, and you will need to adjust to this new normal. So how to, how to act on this? You, you must be your own health advocate. So, you need to learn about this, and that's why we are all here, to learn. To learn what to look for, what to expect, what to ask. Ask questions. You have doctors, you have nurses, you have people that have worked on this. Ask them. Know your treatment, so what treatments you go and what you got, and why you got that treatment. Know what risks are associated with the treatments that you got. Knowledge is power. So your primary care provider will always be essential. It's going to be your first point of contact. And the person that will deal with your blood pressure, with your high cholesterol, with your diabetes, with, is your, your first point of contact. And you should always be in long, lifelong transplant follow-up with your transplant doctor. Now, this is your team. So this is your support network. So first of all, your family, your family and your caregivers, those that love you, those that care about you. They are your first source of support. And then you have your transplant physician. He will always be there. Sometimes changing institutions like me, but, <laughs> but you, he will be there. You can always, in the appointments, come with a list of questions. Oh, this is happening. What should I do? Your primary care physician, as I said, he's your first line of help when you have a medical problem. So you need to have a good primary care physician. You will always also have very commonly a primary hematologist. This was the person that discovered you had myeloma, you have lymphoma, you have leukemia, or you have. So this is the one that knows you from the blood point of view and will follow you with the transplant physician. And finally, there will be other specialists that will be involved. For example, you develop a vascular necrosis of the hip, then you will need to see an orthopedic surgeon to have it fixed. So this is your care network. And to finish, some resources that you find, this is a one good one. So this, this is Transplant Guidelines mobile app that you can download from the App Sport, Sport Store or from Google Play that will, will list 
guidelines for patients, about the screenings that you need to do, about what to do when you are at six months, at 12 months, at two years. Uh, and it's different for men or women. So this is a good resource for you. And these are some other sources of knowledge, resources here. And I think I'm going to finish there. I hope I wasn't too long. And from now is questions. Thank Doctor, you very much. Thank you very much, folks. Let's hear for Doctor. That was an excellent, all encompassing, encompassing presentation. So we're going to take questions now. Uh, Steve's got a microphone back there. I've got one here. Please raise your hands. We'll try to get to everybody. As I said, try to keep it focused. And I'm sure Doctor will have a few minutes afterwards uh, if you have something specifically to talk about. We're going to start right here. Thank you. That was excellent, Dr. Ayala. Thank you Thanks. very much for volunteering your time to come here today and speak with us. We appreciate it. So my question has to do with pulmonary graft versus host disease. <clears throat> I'm a long-term survivor over 20 years, and I still suffer from uh, chronic GVHD of my lungs and throat and nasal passages. I take a, uh, an immunosuppressant to control it called mycophenolate. I'm sure you're familiar with it. My regular transplant doctor has been encouraging me to try to get off of it. So I try to taper and I try to taper and, and I get a cold and it, you know, I have an immune system response and, it, and I end up right back where I started. So uh, my question has to do with <clears throat> I'm skating the edge of the, the GVHD. In other words, it's present right now. I've got a little cough. I can feel it. I know it's in my lungs and it's impacting me. I cannot fully, fully inflate my lungs or I'll cough. So, and I'm, so I'm taking less, uh, you know, I'm taking less than a full dose of the immunosuppressant. Is it better for us, all the people in here, to skate this edge and allow the, the GVHD some grip on us the, that it exists and is able to flourish at some small level in the body, or is it better for us to push it all the way into the background and take more of the medicine that will push it all the way into the background? You know, so yeah. what, you know, I guess if the long-term GVHD is causing permanent damage, I, I, I just don't know. So I'm asking, you know, which is better, allow the GVHD to exist and take less of the meds or take more of the meds and push it all the way deep into the background? Yeah. So um, this is one of the most difficult decisions for your doctor is when to say let's start going down and to say finally stop your immunosuppression. There are really, not even in the textbooks that we have, specific guidelines on how to do it or when to do it. It becomes like an art. Um, so you want to have the, the grabbers who have this is dormant, like at the lowest level possible, hopefully inactive, before you stop the immunosuppression. That's the rule of thumb. Now we have sometimes patients that have had grabbers who have this is for many years, and at some point you, you wonder, is the immunosuppression really helping here? Yes, it's, that's hard to answer. So, and in, in grabbers to have disease, in many patients it becomes dormant, and now the patient is not dealing with grabbers to have disease, but it's just dealing with the damage that it did. You see, and so then, in that situation, stopping the immunosuppression wouldn't be a, a bad idea. But this is a decision that has to be through close collaboration with your transplant doctor. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Again, thank you very much for being here today. It definitely means a great deal to everyone, including myself. Um, my question is in regards to stem cell transplant. Um, my sister was 100% match, and uh, I'm thankful for that. The question I have is, is there any programs available um, potentially to be able to 
uh, to use her stem cells and to store them for potential future use if needed? Um, yes, there are several programs, but you have to be very careful about this. Um, many of you probably have heard about banking um, core blood cells. And there are many public core blood banks. So sometimes we use core blood, core blood as the source of cells for bone marrow transplantation. So, but there are companies that are for profit that will do that. They say, oh, the, the mother that is giving the childbirth and they tell the mother, oh, say, Save your, your core blood for your son in case he needs it in the future. And then you will pay a lot of money to save the, the core blood cells for years. But in reality, the chance that this person, this baby is going to use those core blood cells is close, is extremely, extremely low. They will be sleeping in a freezer for life. While if you put them in a public core blood bank that will be available for patients everywhere to use when they need them. So that's why it's very important. Some of these companies are for profit and they will offer those services. But if you um, do it in one of, you donate them to a core blood bank, they will help patients. Now, that's for core blood cells. Adult cells, we rarely, if ever, would save a lot of cells from a donor for future. One exception is, and this is not your case, I think, is in patients with multiple myeloma. Sometimes in multiple myeloma, we save autologous stem cells for a second transplant. But in donor transplants, we don't do that. Thank you. Um, my question is regarding the um, vaccinations, and if this current measles epidemic continues, will there potentially be any uh, new thought process on revaccinating with the MMR? I know right now you have to be off of all your immunosuppressants. Could that potentially change? That's a very interesting question, and I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story. Years ago. Uh, there was an epidemic of measles in Brazil. And then, like you said, because this is a live virus, the vaccine is a live virus, we don't want to do it in patients that are still on immunosuppression. Because there is a small theoretical risk that the virus, even though it's a weak virus, will grow and cause problems. Because you are immunosuppressed. So, but this to try to cut this epidemic in Brazil, they started vaccinating even patients that were in immunosuppression. And they didn't have problems. It worked. Will it happen here in the States? I doubt it. But potentially you could do it. I'm not saying do it. I'm just saying there has been some instances in when it has been done. Um, I have a short question and then another one, if that's okay. I wanted to ask in regards to um, the vaccinations, just what she was speaking about, can't they check the titers? Because doesn't yes. that come across with our donors' um, cells? No, that's a good point. They don't come with the donor cells. Uh, and why is that? Because when you get a marrow from a donor, you get very few cells. They have to grow and grow, they have to expand many, many, many times. So even if you had a few immune cells that were reactive to tetanus, they will be very few. They will not protect you. Okay. So you need to be revaccinated. And then in regards to um, being immunocompromised, I know that the risk of infection is higher you know, post three months or those first three months, I am still 15 months out and I am still on the same amount of immunosuppressants that I was once they found the right balance. 
Um, does that mean that my risk is still just as high as it was three months it, post-transplant? It, it's not as high as it was in the first three months, even on immunosuppression. Even on immunosuppression, to some degree, your immune system recovers. So the highest risk pe period is the first three months. However, for as long as you are in immunosuppression, your immune system is not fully functional. So you have to be aware of that. Okay. Okay. What else? Uh, next, I think. Or, or. I was just wondering what causes GVH to resurface after it's under control? Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, over the years, I've seen patients that um, were on immunosuppression, Grubber's heart disease becomes dormant, and sometimes you start going down, and it's, it sounds that you didn't keep the patient in immunosuppression long enough, and then as soon as you stop it, boom, it comes back. And you say, boomer. So here we go again. You have to go back to where you started, put the patient back in immunosuppression. Having said that, you, sometimes you have a patient that has been off, off immunosuppression for six months and suddenly develops rash, develops dry mouth, dry eyes. It happened to me just a few weeks ago with a patient that I had. So why did it happen? I don't know. I wouldn't be able to tell you. But, well, if it happened, we had to deal with it and put it to sleep. That was actually my question, too. Uh, I, I had graft versus host disease, as you know, because he's my doctor. He was my doctor <laughs> for three years, and it just suddenly went away. And I've been, uh, I haven't had any uh, recurrences for over a year now, and that was my question. And what Which percentage is... of the people will get it back? And that, that's a very, very good point. Once it becomes dormant, the longer it stays dormant, the less the chance it will ever come back. So if you have been two or three years without it, it would be extremely rare at this point to have it back. Sort of like the cancer itself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay. One last question. Hi. Hi. So she has a question. Uh, do you speak Spanish? Yes, I do. I'm going to, to do the question in English, but if you have more questions, you can talk to her maybe, because she doesn't speak English. I guess so, I'm going to answer both ways. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so she wants to know, um, her daughter has been receiving tacrolimus, an immunosuppressor, for more than three years, but the level in the blood is really low now. So they are trying to figure it out. It is okay to remove the treatment at all, because maybe it's not working now. So I don't know, what do you think about that? So really, again, the time to stop, all patients get tacrolimus or cytolimus or cyclosporin. The time to stop it, definitely, is a clinical decision from the transplant doctor. And it depends on many things. It depends you are doing well, you are, haven't had any problems, you didn't have acute gravers to heart disease, the early form, then, your doctor would consider stopping it somewhere around six months after transplant. There is also a lot of personal variation. Some doctors prefer to keep patients longer on immunosuppression than others. Okay. But in general, you always want as a goal to eventually stop immunosuppression on everybody. So, y para decirlo en español, es difícil saber cuál es el momento de parar la inmunosupresión. Es una decisión del doctor de trasplante que tú tengas. Si tú no has desarrollado enfermedad de injerto contra huésped aguda, y si tú no has tenido ningún problema hasta ahora, eso le da al médico ¿no? la posibilidad de parar la inmunosupresión más temprano. Pero si tú ya has tenido enfermedad de injerto contra huésped, de, de, te va a tocar esperar. Doctor, thank you very, very much. Let's hear it. Thank you.